Welcome to UO Today. I'm Barbara Altman, Director of the Oregon Humanities Center. Our guest today is Nala Kamig Dennis Banks, an elder of the Anishinaabe Nation. He is a Native American leader, teacher, lecturer, activist, and author. In 1968, Banks co-founded the American Indian Movement to protect the traditional ways of Indian people and to engage in legal cases protecting treaty rights of natives. In the 70s, he was a leader of takeovers at Alcatraz Island, the Bureau of Indian Affairs offices in Washington, D.C., and the 71-day occupation of Wounded Knee in South Dakota. Banks was among 300 Indian activists arrested at Wounded Knee. He was acquitted of charges, but was convicted of riot and assault in connection with a protest in Custer, South Dakota in 1973. He went underground rather than serve time in prison and later received amnesty from California Governor Jerry Brown and sanctuary on the Onondaga Reservation in upstate New York. Banks surrendered to law enforcement officials in South Dakota in 1985 and served 18 months in prison. When released, he worked as a drug and alcohol counselor on South Dakota's Pine Ridge Reservation. Ojibwa warrior Dennis Banks and the Rise of the American Indian Movement from 2004 is an autobiography written with Richard Erdos. The book details Banks's life and his work with the American Indian Movement. Banks was instrumental in organizing the Longest Walk Three, a 5,000 mile nationwide walk to raise awareness of the prevalence of diabetes among Native Americans. As a guest of the UO's Northwest Indian Language Institute, Banks spoke about diabetes, The Longest Walk Three, and the American Indian Movement on May 13, 2011. Dennis, welcome to UO Today. Good to be here. We're yeah. very happy to have you speak with us. By the way, I, uh, uh, you mentioned that I uh, organized Longest Walk Three. I also organized Longest Walk One, which was 30 years, uh, actually 33 years uh, ago. 1978 was the first walk and then I organized this Longest Walk 2, which was 2008, 30 years later. So, wow. Uh, I've been doing uh, many walks in, in, in this country. Seven times I've walked across the country, um, and six times in running events, relay events, uh, running. So, um, I know this country good. I know From one end yep. to the other. Yep. I want to ask you to tell us a whole lot more about Longest Walk 3 and the history of mm -hmm. it, but I wondered if you would go back a little bit first. You had, um, you had a hard life before you decided to become an activist. Can you talk a little bit about what led up to your founding of the American Indian Movement? Well, there's, of course, the, um, the one issue which is very painful was, the, was when I was forced, to, taken by, by force and off, off the reservation and sent to a military boarding school in 19, uh, during the 40s, early 40s, 1943. Uh, I, along with my older brother and sister, almost like rounding up the children. Um, they, it, it wasn't indiscriminate rounding up, they, but they worked with the social uh, system in, in, those, in those counties, of which ones were on the county rolls. And those are the ones that uh, that they would let go. So, and so I spent six years in in in, in a boarding school without seeing my mother, without seeing my father, without seeing my grandparents, who I love dearly. And and then, of course, uh, being forced to uh, speak only English, um, and uh, there was corporal punishment there. Um, Harsh, tr harsh treatment, um, and I would, after six years, I, allow, I was allowed to go home for for thirty days. Then I, they sent me to another boarding school in North Dakota, and again, uh, without being, being able to s communicate with my with my parents or my with my grandparents, or and then also forbidden, to, as I said, to speak uh, the Ojibwe language, um, and. And there was punishment for that as well, and so we couldn't. We I never heard the drums. I never heard uh, the singing. I never heard any uh, anybody speaking. Anybody in the Ojibwe language. But that wasn't just happening to me. It was happening to thousands of other children at the same time during the 40s, and 
it was it was very bad. It was a very bad time in my history. It was because I seen pain, I felt the pain, and I remember it. So it um, it, it had a very uh, it was a bad experience in my life. Um, I think all of those. Uh, I went into the military, and uh, that's where I and I wanted it to become my career. I, I because I was I was in the military boarding school, I, I had all of the training of, of marching to school, marching to breakfast, marching to the, to the classroom, and so I I could get up early and I could make my bed early and I could shine my shoes and I could say yes sir and no sir and yes ma'am and no ma'am, um, and and began to forget about what it was to be Anishinaabe. And that was that was the experiment in, in the school, um, but it, it it groomed me then for a, a, what I felt would be a good life in the military, and it started out to be. But I, I witnessed some some um, some military operations in in in, um, in Japan uh, that I didn't like, and it was um, it was something that I did not want to be part of. And so I, when the contract ended, I left the military. I left the military. So, but all of that s kind of began to prepare me for what I was about to get into, and that was to find finding uh, information about the Anishinaabe people, which I was denied at in, in public school system or in, in, the, in these military schools. And then I began to find out more and more. Even I went back to the reservation, and um, it, it, uh, I was hearing things. I began to hear the music again, and I thought, oh, wow. It was so, I was so lonesome for, for the lang to hear the language. I was so lonesome for the music and the dances and the powwows and the gatherings and the wild rice and, and the harvesting of the maple syrup and the everything. About my life, but my before that, um, I began to it started to come back, and I, but there was uh, then I realized that there had to be major changes in this in this uh, in the policies of the country, and how it affected native native rights, uh, our fishing rights, hunting rights, even the right to gather wild rice. So then I began to politicize myself, my mind, and what, what are the steps that I need to do to, to make these changes? And um, then the American Indian Movement formed. Um, but there was, there was an incident that happened before that which sent me to prison. Uh, I couldn't find work in, in the cities and just being denied um, work. I had, I, had a, um, I had a high school diploma, I had, I had military experience, um, but I couldn't use any of that experience. I couldn't find work, and it was just, uh, it was a, another bad dream that was happening. And um, I broke into a grocery store and uh, filled up bags upon bags of, and you know, put them in my pickup, and, and then and I went home, and I had been drinking, so that kind of gave me some inspiration to do it um, and I woke up my children and my family I said we're eating steaks tonight and um, and there was a knock on the door it was the police they said is that your truck out there and I said yes <laughs> it, was, it was snowing out and they followed the <laughs> right from the grocery store to my home so um, and they 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 arrested me, and one of the, the the officer, one of the officers said, "Should we take all this, these evidence?" He says, and he said, "Let them have it." And uh, because I think uh, at, at that moment, I think he, he understood why I did that. But I went to prison, and I was sentenced to five years, which is very unusual for doing that kind of. It was it was not a crime where there was guns involved and, and um, but I did go it was in that in that time in, in prison that I began to read and absorb information about about the Anishinaabe people my people who was who I was 
And then th that was what I began to, what do I need to do to change this? And I felt I wanted to be part of I was reading the newspapers every day about, this is in the early 60s, about 100,000 people in the streets protesting against the war in Vietnam. 100,000, 200,000 people in Washington, D.C. on one of those marches and on, on civil rights. But there was no one, I couldn't, no one was talking about Native issues. No one was speaking for Native people. And that's what I felt. We need someone, we need someone to be speaking about Native issues. Not that it was going to be me. I just felt we need to start an organization. We need to start a movement that will speak for, for what we're going through. So when I was released in 1968, um, after two years, I went knocking door to door and told people I would like for them to come to a meeting. And that's kind of like what began. That was the first meeting in July. July 28, 1968 was the first meeting of the American Indian Movement. We didn't know it was going to be called AIM, but it was just a gathering of Native people. Um, and when the name came about three or four months later. But that's, those are the issues. The issues were unemployment, the high unemployment, the, the, uh, the slum conditions that we had to live in, and also police brutality. Those were the three major uh, ur rural, urban conditions that we, that we wanted to change. And then the native issues were the lack of, or, or the attack on the treaty rights, hunting rights, fishing rights, and the failure of the government to look up to support the treaties and to honor those treaties. So those, those were the, that's what set the stage for AIM to be born. And it, it just exploded on the scene. I mean, uh, um, we marched on the police the very next morning, and, and, and we uh, marched on, on, on the human, human services there in, in Minneapolis about the, about the conditions of living in slum conditions. Um, and what we went, on to, went to the employment office. Um, we didn't, where do we go to, to, you know, to, to, to protest about the unemployment? We went to the employment office and they, those are the ones that just issue out the checks there. But we went there anyway, and we went there, and we, then we marched on the state capitol in Minnesota. So that was, that was the early beginnings of the American Indian Movement. I have to ask you very briefly before we get to the longest walk, what piece of that precipitated Wounded Knee? Most people know about the occupation, but I'm not sure everybody really knows what led up to it and why you all took that action. There were two things that happened. Uh, one was there was a call from from South Dakota to our national office in, in Minneapolis, and, and that was in 1972. Uh, that, that call was um, uh, from the Yellow Thunder family that their son Raymond had been killed, uh, had been brutally beaten, uh, and they went to the FBI, they went to the South Dakota police, they went to the state, state police, they went to Nebraska where he was killed, but nobody would touch it. They were saying, no, the BIA has jurisdiction here. They went to the BIA police, and they said, no, it's not ours. It's the FBI. So nobody was doing anything. And as a last resort, they called the American Indian Movement, and we went out there. We went out there. We had our own investigators out there. We found out who killed the person. Um, even after the autopsy, he said he died of natural, of, of um, uh, uh, that he froze to death. And Nobody in, in South Dakota, Minnesota, people who are born up there, you don't go out into the streets with your, just your T-shirt in, in sub-zero temperatures. You don't do that. So we knew something else was, was, was there. So um, we had our own autopsy fly in from Minneapolis, and, and we had a court order. Uh, we had the body brought back up, and it was determined by our, uh, our pathologist that uh, that he died of, of severe blows to the head with the blunt instruments. And as it turned out, uh, we found out who it was, the Hare brothers, and they'd beaten him with tire irons. And that's how he died. Um, he, didn't die to, he didn't die of exposure to the, to the, to the climate. He, died of, he was brutally beaten. And then the second incident, of course, was the call from the Oglalas 
that's where we were at. We were in Oglala Territory on the Pine Ridge Reservation that the, uh, the chiefs were calling for an impeachment of their president. And that was, um, it, um, when the impeachment failed and they called on us, well, we were already there. I, I, I had ventured north to the Shine River and they, they had several meetings there and they called for the impeachment and that failed and then they called they called on us, the American Indian Movement. So those two things, for Tripp say, that, that's what precipitated uh, before Wounded Knee. Do you ever find yourself surprised that you ended up in, a, in such a compelling leadership position on such a very important issues? Could you imagine this when you were a little boy at that boarding school? Oh, no. It never, it never entered my mind at all. I'm, uh, in, in the boarding school, I kept running away from these schools because I couldn't accept the punishment. And I just, you know, and, and the, you know the, the disciplinarians say, why are you, why do you keep running away? You know you're going to get your punishment. And I, I would say, because I don't like the school. I didn't like what they were doing to me. I couldn't accept it. And so I couldn't, I, could, I never once envisioned saying that I'm going to rise up someday and I'm going to make some major changes. And say, no, that was, that was far from my thought. Even, even the, when, on the issues that I do today, I, I, I select uh, which ones I think are extremely important and I go and speak on those issues and, uh, and then people are saying, it's about time somebody's speaking. Uh, so I never once uh, thought Dennis Banks was going to be well known. Um, I, 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 I couldn't. Marlon Brando is going to be well known. He's a, you know, that's the, pre that's who I thought was, who are well known people. That, you know, never realizing that those are just movie stars. You know, they're popular movie stars. But you're not using that name at random, right? You spent a lot of time with Marlon Brando when you were a younger man. Yeah, I, um, I first saw Marlon when I was in the military. I was in, I was in, in, in Asia. And he was in there doing a movie called Sayonara. And I didn't get a chance to meet him because there were so many GIs there. Uh, but I did meet uh, Michener, uh, who wrote the book, uh, Tales of the South Pacific and Sayonara. So I did meet him. And, uh, but I, never, I couldn't. The, the crush was too big. <laughs> there was about 2,000 people that were trying to meet Marlon Brando. And I was just way in the back there. And I think, well, at least I saw him. And then 20-some years later, uh, I was sitting in a courtroom on the wounded knee charges, and uh, Brando comes there to support us. And I was, whoa, it's, it's ironic. That, and then, then we became friends, close friends, and up until his death. Um, and I, I lived on his island in Tahiti, traveled with Marlon, we, we traveled together. and. Um, it was, it was sad for me to see his family, how they, some of it was coming apart because of uh, killings and stuff like that. Yeah, not, a, not an easy story. Yeah. Dennis, I don't want to run out of time before I get you to talk about The Longest Walk 3, which was preceded, as you pointed out, by number two and number one. This mm -hmm. is something you've been working on for a long time now. And the focus of it is the high incidence of diabetes in the Native American population, right? Right. You have a personal history with that. You well, were diagnosed with I, diabetes. Yeah, I, I had a heart attack when I was 72. And, um, and when I woke up, uh, they said, uh, we also got some other bad news for you. You're, you're, you're diabetic. And to me, that was more dangerous than the heart attack itself. And and it was like the kiss of death. And I was very depressed and finally I decided, after about an hour of almost like just thinking of, of surgery, thinking of, 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 of re removing my legs and amputations and going blind, I was reading up on diabetes, what it could cause. And I, that's what it was depressing. And I thought, wow, I don't wanna, I don't wanna go out this way. And then I thought, no, I got to do something about it. I got to, I, for myself, I got to do something for, so I don't have to go through it. So I started absorbing more information. What can I do? Uh, 
even today, I'm still picking up little pieces of information. What can help the, uh, you know, what's, what foods can I eat that, that's going to that's gonna be a good balance to everything else in my system? W the more I find out about it, and then the more I was reading, I realized then I had to do something about, about diabetes. So I wanted to reverse it in my system. And my glucose was like 305 on up. But when I, when I started to, to, to eat nothing but vegetables, it was 305. And a week later, it was 95, normal. But I've kept that up. I've just raw vegetables. I just nine kinds of ve vegetables, including, including dandelions. So and I'll cut them off and I'll eat them. And even, I'll even eat the f leaves, you know. So I think but because food, food is medicine, it, it is strong medicine, and could be the only medicine that, that, that we need to, to get rid of some of these, uh, um, these diseases like cancer. I mean, we can fight cancer by eating the proper foods. But it's really a big, complicated issue because it's not just a question of the, the malady of diabetes. It's also one of nutrition, politics, returning to a more traditional lifestyle. How do you approach this as something that, how do you make sense of it to the Native American population? Well, first of all, I tell them that we got the very close thing to fry bread. We got to put that in the back burner. But we need exercise. Native people before cars and everything. We used to walk distances, great distances, run great distances. And so the more exercise involved in that, the more your body is fighting off any kind of disease. Um, and if you're eating good, nutritious food, that even helps it. So prevents, make sure nothing gets in. I think we have to, we have to change the lifestyle of, 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 of the pattern of how we eat. Uh, we don't view food as medicine anymore. We, we view it as pork chops and cheeseburgers and french fries. You know, that's the view of it, nothing more. And because not understanding that maybe some of this food is medicine and that can help me, help me with my complexion instead of pouring all kinds of stuff. So um, the, 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 the change, um, you know, diabetes is caused from a, a, a lifestyle of eating bad foods, and, and we have to change that. We have to change the pattern of how we eat um, and get rid of all those. And, and you know, there's, there's soft drinks in this country, soft drinks, but there's nothing soft about these drinks. And I know you take a penny and you pour Coke, Coke in her, and three to four days, you can see that thing sizzling underneath there. And then, and then when you start taking it out like that, you can see the penny disappearing. And I, the experiment was like about 14 days. And that penny was reduced to like a little, it ate up that whole penny, copper. So if it does that to that hard system, what do you think it's doing to our soft system? Yeah. How many people are participating on this longest walk three? We have uh, 32 walkers uh, in, uh, 35 walkers in a southern walk, and we have 15 on a northern walk. And we're collecting information as we go along. Uh, we have four people who are diabetics on the south walk. Uh, in, um, by the way, when I, I was on nine, when I left the hospital after the heart attack and being declared a diabetic, I left with nine kinds of pills I had to take every day. And I take two of them twice a day. And they said, you will be on this. This is what you'll be on for the rest of your life. And I thought, that's what I thought. Wow, I don't want to do this. And, and so when I started reversing diabetes in my system, eating nothing but good foods and vegetables and raw vegetables, and I go back to the doctors and they said, you're improving quite a bit. You don't need to take this anymore. And within a month, every one of them except Plavix was, was, was taken off pills that I had to take. And after a year, I, I was off Plavix. So now, I don't take any medication. I don't have to take it. Um, I might die today of a heart attack, but it's not going to be related to diabetes. And so that's, that's my mission. 
In the literature on your website, I read that you're hoping to more or less do away with diabetes in the Native American community in 50, 50 years? 50 years, yeah. I think a 50-year plan would be... 50 years starting now? Oh, starting Or starting we, back with the first long walk? <laughs> no, but we can do it in 50 years. It's going to take a, a long time. Uh, I now know, you know, IHS is saying there's 12 to 15 percent are diabetic Native people, but I now believe it's more like 50 to 60 percent of what I've seen. <coughs> the Pima Maricopa is 95 percent of their 28,000 people are diabetics, 95 percent. The Toto Odom people are 100 percent diabetics. So <coughs> I think, the, as I said, that the, that the figure is more like 50 to 60 percent. So we'll have a, a, have a long time to, to change the attitude, get them back to guarding, get, them back, get, get us all back to running or walking, even two or three miles a day is, is going to be good. I know the northern route left from Portland, Oregon, right? right. And on February 14th, no coincidence there, Heart Day, That's Valentine's right. mm -hmm. Day. And the, uh, the destination is Washington, D.C. They'll get there in July, is that right? We'll get both, get both, both walk to July 8th. And we're hoping to have a pull off a, uh, a summit on, on diabetes. And so it, it, the, the summit won't necessarily be in, in, in D.C. It'll be Virginia or someplace where we can get a big, large place for gathering. Um, but we want to present some information to the Obama administration. Um, and, but mostly, uh, I want to expose what, what the issues are out there on diabetes. And it's, it's kind of shocking. So. It was a whole education for me, reading your materials. And I'm sure it will be when you speak with the local audience, too. Sorry to say we're out of time. Oh, that's good. But thank you so much for coming uh, oh, and doing this. To be here. I'll be watching your progress across the country. Well, oh, thank you. Thank you. We've been speaking with Nawa Kamig Dennis Banks, an elder of the An Anishinaabe Nation. He is a Native American leader, teacher, lecturer, activist, and author. Banks was instrumental in organizing the Longest Walk 3, a 5,000-mile nationwide walk to raise awareness of the prevalence of diabetes among Native Americans. Banks spoke about diabetes, the Longest Walk 3, and the American Indian Movement on May 13, 2011, as a guest of the U of O's Northwest Indian Language Institute. His talk was co-sponsored by the Oregon Humanities Center. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.